Hi everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Get Cooked. I'm Sarah Cook and today I am talking to Jess Morrison, member of the Australian rowing team and one of our athletes based at the Women's National Training Centre up in Penrith, although not at the moment, Jess, you're home in Melbourne. Yes, I am. Thanks for having me. Um, Love being home, not going to lie. Got everything I need in the garage and um, definitely brings back a lot of memories from the previous winters I've had training at home. So I know how it goes and trying to make the most of it and see some positives in it. And coming from a swimming ground, you're probably used to training on your own from time to time as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been rowing for seven years now, almost seven years. So definitely getting the hang of it. But, you know, that routine of morning, evening training sessions I've been doing since I was like 12, 10. So, um, you know, I've I've been doing the routine for a, a long time and there are definitely a lot of similarities between the two. Yeah, so talking about swimming and uh, your previous sporting career, um, you had an interesting journey into rowing. You were actually at the AIS on scholarship as a swimmer at the time that you were discovered for rowing. Can you tell us a little bit about how that all came to be? Yeah, definitely. Um, You know, a great time for me just in terms of um, taking an opportunity. I never thought that I would do rowing at all. Um, My school... Uh, rowing coaches tried to get me to do it when I was in school but it always clashed with swimming so I never really gave it a go. Um, I was up in Canberra in 2012 and 13. Um, I hurt my shoulder and had to have uh, a shoulder reconstruction in May of 2013 and during the rehab process I um, was in the gym a few times on the ergo. Um, I'd met Kim and Scott Brennan the year before in the Altitude House at the AIS. So I sort of developed a friendship with them then. And it was sort of by chance, Kim sort of told me one day, oh, why don't you try rowing? You'd be great at it. Um, She was like, come to the gym. I'll introduce you to Lyle, her coach at the time. Um, And so off I went one day and met Lyle and the rest of the rowers. And he sort of got me on the erg and did a few short pieces. And um, from there, I sort of went down to the sheds every so often and learned how to row in the single and the double. And obviously this was all sort of in secret because I was sort of rehabbing back to swimming. Um, And that's sort of how it sort of evolved from there. And um, I moved back to Melbourne at the end of that year and I was supported by the VIS as like a transfer athlete. Um, And so that's kind of how it all started. I was injured and given an opportunity and... Um, never looked back I guess. It's amazing that Kim was the one that suggested it to you because she had a very similar journey into the sport. Um, She was injured from track and field, had stress fractures in both of her feet, was rehabbing on the ergo at the VIS and one of the VIS rowing coaches at the time, John Kumpa, saw her and and did exactly the same thing, suggested why don't you come across to rowing and obviously that paid huge dividends for her as, as it has for you. So it's amazing that someone that came through that journey herself was the one that suggested the same path way for you yeah I know um you know it was definitely unconventional it wasn't a a rowing coach you know or a program that sort of found me it was just you know a friend at the institute and uh, I'd lost my scholarship at the time um, for swimming so that was due to run out by the end of that year and I was sort of just rehabbing and training away and I was you know in a pretty sad state and my Olympic dream was basically crushed all I've ever wanted as far as I can remember, was, you know, to represent Australia, um, the Olympic swimming. So never crossed my mind that I would, you know, get there doing another sport. Um, Definitely goes to show that, you know, if one door closes and another can open, you've just sort of got to be open to different opportunities um, and embrace things that come your way that you might not have thought for yourself. Absolutely. And and that was one of the great things about the Institute. I was a scholarship holder there for many years and, and that's how I talent tr- transferred into into sailing. So, you know, it was such a great environment, high performance environment. And it it really does make sense that if you're talented in one sport, but, you, you know, that door closes for whatever reason, injury in your case, to then be able to transition into another sport. And now we look at you seven years down the track you're a world championship medalist, you're on track for your second Olympic Games. It really is a pretty amazing story that you've had. 
Yeah, I've been very lucky and very grateful for all of the support I've had along the way. It hasn't um, been a very, I mean, it's been a very up and down journey. I was definitely injured a few times in my transition um, and it took a while to sort of get the hang of rowing, but, you know, it eventually came good after a few patient years. Yeah, well, swimmers tend to make excellent rowers. Um, you know, we've seen someone like Ollie Zeidler, who came from a um, competitive swimming background into rowing only two or three years ago. And, you know, we know that some of those skills are really transferable. You're strong, you're fit, have a great engine, you know how to train, you've been in a structured training program from a very young age, you know how to compete, you have that mentality, um, and, and that's all you know, things that you can take into rowing and that are highly transferable and important. But can you tell us about some of the challenges that you faced in terms of cha- changing yourself physically from a swimmer to a rower, a sport very, I guess, upper body dominant to one that was predominantly lower body based? Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it took about, about a year and a half to make that physical change of strength moving from my upper body to my legs. When I first started rowing, I basically rowed with my upper body. Um, and it wasn't a surprise that I got my first rib stress fracture four months you know, into rowing. Um, and then I had a back injury that year as well. So I, I was very used to you know, the volume of training that's quite similar with swimming and rowing. You know, you've got 10 sessions a week swimming and something similar to rowing. You've got your three weights. Um, I wasn't used to sort of the endurance, um, K's on the bike, you know, just the, the, I mean, my event for swimming was a minute to two minutes long. Um, And then you go to rowing and everyone races two K's and that's quite a big difference in terms of um, how you have to prepare for that. So it definitely took a couple of years just to develop that sort of um, aerobic base um, and, and have that transfer of strength, sort of upper body to legs. I, you know, if I look at photos of me now, I look so different to what I did swimming, put on about 10 kilos as well. <laughs> That's the beauty about being a heavyweight rower. You've got a bit of freedom in that space. You know, I'd never ridden on a bike before and I got my first road bike that year when I started rowing and a 40k ride would kind of put me in bed all day. I was exhausted and it took, it does take years to sort of develop that, um, that strength endurance and, and ability to sort of do that many, you know, kilometres on the bike, on the ergo. So you have to be patient and give yourself a couple of years to make that change. I was so desperate, though, to get to the top of rowing. Um, the biggest challenge for me was coming at a somewhat OK level in one sport and then going to the complete bottom in another, you know, getting beaten by school kids. My first regatta, I remember it was in Ballarat in the single skull. On the start line, absolutely had no idea what I was doing. You know, they called the start and I was at like a 45 degree angle did two strokes and was in the bank. Um, and that was pretty embarrassing. I finished that race and, you know, came last, but I kind of thought to myself, I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I've just, what, you know, I've started this sport. I'm so desperate to get to the top and to um, fulfill a dream and having to start from the bottom, it kind of like, you know, it wasn't that enjoyable and I wasn't that good at it. So, you know, persistence and hard work and, you know, enjoying the small wins along the way helps but the biggest challenge was sort of starting from scratch (laughs) did you find when I found that when I started a new sport in a similar situation that I went from one where I was making you know one percent gains and and you're really just operating at at the highest level you know technically physically to one where all of a sudden you know you get these light bulb moments and it's like a 10 percent gain like did you find that rewarding Oh, absolutely. And the fact that people have so much belief in you really gives you that motivation to get up and give it a crack. I think, you know, when Lyle was teaching me how to row the single in 2013, I was terrible. I didn't even, I went out in my shorts and t-shirt and aviators. Um, My hands, you couldn't even see the skin because they were completely wrapped in um, tape. I had the worst blisters ever. I'd fall in the whole time. You know, I was terrible, but I kept rocking up every day. And I think, the fact that you just are willing to have a go and keep going and people recognise and see that in you and they sort of encourage you to, you know, to keep going and that's really powerful for people that are in a position of um, they just want some hope um, and a bit of a steer. And um, so, you know, you definitely enjoy those gains. They're definitely more than 1% <laughs> as they were like at the top end of a sport, but 
just having people that believe in you and encourage you every single day, trying something new, um, you know, is, is incredibly powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that hard work was paid off. You competed at the 2016 Olympic Games, although it was a bit of an interesting journey to get there. You guys got the late call up in the women's eight um, after a, a doping ban to one of the other nations. And in fact, one of your teammates was quoted in the media as saying that she was in a pub when she got the call. So can you tell us a little bit about that journey um, to getting to your first Olympic Games? Yeah, um so I'd sort of just got the hang of rowing. I, you know, the start of 2015, I, I hopped into a pair with one of my good friends from Mercantile Rowing Club. Um, I missed, we missed out on the team that year, but we were close. We, you know, came second at, at nationals and sort of had a really good year of training. And at the end of that year, the selectors decided that they would have everybody race the single skull you know, sweepers and scholars all racing the single, they'd form a rank um, and then, you know, the top part, you know, would hop off and um, seat race for sculling and then sort of the next group of girls we'd race to sort of make an eight that might get sent to the qualification regatta and that suited me quite well because I'd worked out how to row the um, single, I was, you know, okay at it, so I got myself into that group um, and so qualify, you know, made the eight based on rowing the single skull, which is maybe a bit different than normal. Um, trained, you know, in Sydney with the girls and Mark Fang and Hall, our coach, and, you know, thought we were going pretty fast. We were pretty fast and um, went off to race the qualification regatta and, um, you know, we came third. Unfortunately, not the top two that you need. Um, so another you know, sad time of my sporting career and went home and uh, I didn't think that there was a chance that we could get a call up. I know some of the girls were sort of um, reading about it a lot and our group chat was pretty active, you know, when we'd share some articles about, oh, you know, you know, um, Russia could be banned. What do you guys think? And um, I didn't really think too much about it. I was busy doing other things. Um, and much to our surprise, we, we got a call out of the blue. I was at home at the time, family dinner or something. Um, and our CEO, Michael Scott, sort of said, pack your bags, girls, you're off to, off to Rio. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, complete shock. And we got everybody together in Melbourne quickly after that because most of us were based here and Bill Tate sort of helped us with our final preparation of three and a half weeks or so. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of us were still keeping fit, doing other things. Two of the two girls were training for a marathon. I was training for a um, cross country ski marathon. Um, and so, you know, we were keeping active, but a beautiful three and a half week preparation. And off we went to, uh, to Brazil and, um, to give it the best shot we could. And, um, unbelievable. It was a great, great time, great opportunity. And, um, Certainly. Definitely unconventional, though. It's not how you dream of going to the Olympic Games. No, no, I bet. But did that spur you on then to want to go to Tokyo? Because you took a bit of a little bit of a break after that because you found out not long after that you got into Melbourne Business School to continue with your studies. So uh, that was obviously the next focus for you. But in the back of your mind, was Tokyo always the goal? Uh, definitely. Um, I think... Just when we hadn't qualified, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? I'll apply to business school. And um, I found out, you know, after we'd gone to the games that I'd gotten in. And it was something that I really wanted to pursue full time. Just with my undergrad, it was kind of broken up a lot. You know, a lot of online study. And I switched to ANU when I moved to Canberra. So I kind of wanted a really nice university experience where I could properly, you know, immerse myself in it. Um, so I made the decision not to go to the training centre straight away like some of the girls did and I'd always wanted to go to Tokyo to have you know a proper lead in and just to see how much better I could do or you know definitely aim for a better result um so yeah it was always my plan to have one to two years off and then hop back into it um and it's working well so far despite the little uh, delay this year <laughs> yeah and you've um, managed to sort of balance a bit of a dual career you successfully finished your course and you're employed at ey yep 
And how important do you think it is having that dual career and that dual focus? I, yeah, I definitely value the balance in my life. Um, I learned a hard lesson when I was in Canberra, um, losing my scholarship, and I felt like, you know, a carpet was ripped out underneath me and I had nothing left. And um, I was studying part-time at the time, but I didn't really love the course that I was doing so much. And it made me realise, oh, I need to do something else that um, keeps me busy and something I'm passionate about. So I've really made a concerted effort to sort of have um, a different area of my life that I pursue and and do and find interesting, just um, to not put all my eggs in one basket, I guess. And I definitely find that studying or or working alongside rowing helps to switch off. I'm somebody that if I'm more busy, I tend to be more productive in every, at everything. Um, and I like the lifestyle of being a bit busy and having a lot, a lot of things going on. I do recognise that some people find it hard to divide their time, so it doesn't suit everybody, but it's something that I've learnt to value quite a lot and it's helped my rowing career. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with you. So well done, because I know that it does get really tough, especially, uh, you know, when you're studying and you've got a lot of assessments and and things like that. But um, also managing work in your case um, at EY as well. So obviously the system has changed through the two cycles. You were, I guess, at that point where we moved from one system, a a more federated system in the sport, to now a centralised training model um, where we've got a men's centre in Canberra, a women's centre up in Penrith. Can you tell us a little bit about how the support has changed and how that dynamic has changed? And and we're obviously seeing huge success now, particularly with the women's squad at the World Championships last year. Can you talk to, um, I guess, some of the benefits of the of the centralised model and the support that you're getting, particularly from Mrs. Reinhardt as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I wasn't around for the complete cycle with rowing um, prior to the centralised system, but it was definitely... Um, up to what state you're in and then you followed the program of your state institute and you rode with people who were in your state unless you could afford to um, travel around and find pair partners so it was all a little bit messy and um and everyone was doing different programs and you know getting different results based on different preparations and you sort of do national ergs and receive a spreadsheet and you'd see some awesome scores and you're like cool how do those people get those scores what programs do they do so it was all always that, um, you know, um, the state-based system definitely worked for individuals, um, but as a collective, when people came together, it was kind of find, hard to find synergies or everyone compromise on a, on a training program. Um, that was the case when we came together in the eight in 2016. You know, we'd all done um, different training programs and then we all had to come together and align on a new vision and direction of one coach so that's a challenge um, the centralized program is great because you know we have all everybody together in one place and that solves the biggest challenge that we at rowing had I guess beforehand um, and you know you get to see every day what what everybody does in training on you know in the gym and on the erg and you know, everybody knows how good Georgie Rowe is on the egg, breaking all these world records. Um, and we're lucky that we get to train with her every day. And I was in the room when she broke, you know, the 5K record on the ergo. How many times do you get to say that you were in, you know, in the same room as somebody doing that? And, you know, that's a benefit of the centralised program. You've got top talent all together, training together all the time. Um, it wouldn't be possible without the support of Mrs Reinhardt. Um, you know, affording us the opportunities to come together in one place and um, the, the support that we get to live there. Um, we have an incredible team, of, you know, physio, nutrition, massage, everybody there to help us be the best that we can be every single day. Um, and sort of isolated, I would say, a little bit in Penrith. You kind of don't have those distractions that you might have in a big city or in Melbourne, you're purely there to, to row, or at least I am. And so you're definitely focused on task and what you're there to do um, with the best support possible and the opportunity to row with, you know, the best girls in the country. So there's no doubt um, that all those reasons contribute to the success of the, the program over the last few years. 
absolutely and a, and a pretty good team of coaches there leading you guys as well um, so we've got some questions in from our listeners um, who uh, really do want to know, I think, about your transition from rowing, um, sorry, from swimming to rowing. Um, and I guess in that vein, someone wants to know, what do you like better, long or short distance rows? I mean, I think it's a no-brainer, but I'll put it over to you. I'm not. Aerobic's probably not my strength. I like the shorter <laughs> stuff. You know, I'd rather do 10 500s race pace than a 20K paddle, to be honest. I'm with you. I'm 100% with you there. Um, and what's your secret recipe, if you have one, um, to achieving that high performance mentality? Do you think it's something that is innate? Is it something that you're born with or is it something that you learn and develop over time? Um, oh, there probably has to be some element that you're born with it because there has to be a reason that gets you signing up to a club in an early age and wanting to pursue your sporting dream. Um, and, and definitely training in an environment in a club where you see, you know, top level athletes and you want to be like them and you see what they have to do to get to where they are. And um, definitely a lot of it is developed over the course of your sort of training and the environments that you're in. Do you enjoy rowing as a team or swimming alone more? And do you miss swimming? Uh, I miss swimming a lot um, in, early, in the early days of my transition. Um, I loved having complete ownership of a result and training on my own. I'm, when people say you're a rower, you're either an eights rower or like a single skull rower. Sometimes I align more with being a single skull rower, just being like I, you know, um, I'm a bit more single-minded, like doing my own thing, love getting out in the single and just doing training on my own. Um, so the element of sort of having complete control over your training and racing is something I enjoy. Um, I've learned to really love and appreciate, though, the, the elements of, of crew boat racing, though, um, that's come with rowing. So there's a time and a place for both, I think. Oh, so maybe 2024, a different pathway, perhaps. We'll keep an eye out on what you do. Walk in the footsteps of Kimmy, maybe. Um, you're incredibly fit, obviously, from your swimming background and now through your rowing. And there's been a few people that have wanted to know about your chin-ups and how you get your back muscles. But I think that has a bit more to do with swimming than rowing. Yeah, um, I was so weak when I was a swimmer. I was this, like, little lanky person that was not strong and couldn't get strong in the gym um, my swimming coach at the time said, oh, you know, Emily Seabom gets up every morning and does chin-ups before every swimming session. So I started doing that too, you know, rocking up to the pool at five and doing a couple of chin-ups and doing a swimming session. And then over the years, I've done many different weights programs, um, a couple of, you know, when I do four a week and I got really strong over maybe eight years and, um, you know, developed quite a strong upper body and that's come over to rowing um I don't know if you need to be doing as as many chin-ups in rowing but I can just do that just from having done swimming but yeah I was not strong when I was young and I, it took you know years and years of work in the gym um to develop that strength um and once you have it it kind of doesn't leave like if I don't do weights for a month if you're on a break and I find that I'm easily able to pick it up again just because you've I don't know, developed those strength muscles before and they kind of never leave. Yeah, so a bit of muscle memory there. And before we move on to our fast five, we do have a question from one Georgie Rowe who would like to know, do you have a dirty treat yourself meal? Dirty treat yourself meal. <laughs> um, oh, gee, I, I live with Jacinta Edmonds, who's a phenomenal cook, um, and she makes this like sticky date pudding quite a lot and absolutely love that that's probably a dirty treat meal i would say that's pretty good that sounds pretty good to me all right let's move on to our fast five uh the last five questions that we ask everyone um who comes on the show each week um uh, what's your favorite rowing course to row on well i haven't rowed in too many but listen like was beautiful when i was there love that yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, your top track to erg to? Uh, another chance, I think, by Roger Sanchez. Love it. Yeah. Golden oldie. Good. Uh, best piece of advice you've been given to date? 
Um, Lyle McCarthy, there is a difference between true pain and being and uncomfortable. Um, he said that to me when I was erging once and I, it never left me and I think about it all the time um, when I sort of approach a hard session. That is a great piece of advice, particularly when it comes to the sport of rowing. Um, your career highlight to date? Career highlight... Um, I probably, you know, winning the world, the world cup winner last year in the eight in the pair, that was pretty special. Um, and I would say the whole of last year really, but, um, yeah, probably that. Yeah. It was an incredible season for, for you and all of the girls in the training center. And and I know that everyone who saw that, and I was fortunate enough to be in Rotterdam and, and see you guys at world cup three, um, you know, everyone who saw those performances is really looking forward to seeing you guys in action in 2021 now. Um, but yeah, it's a very exciting time for you all. Um, but the last of the five questions, the hardest session you've ever done. Oh, hands down the first 5k erg I've ever done. I know it's not a session, it's more of a test, but nothing can ever compare to how hard that was. Um, that is so close to true pain, like as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, yeah, I did that in Canberra and Lyle was basically standing right behind me the whole time and I just didn't want to give up and I went out way too hard and died. But I just remember getting off that thinking that is the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there's plenty, plenty more of those to come for you on your journey through to Tokyo and beyond. But thanks very much for joining us today, Jess. It's been great to talk to you. And we, of course, wish you all the very best on your journey out of this shutdown and, and onto the path to the Olympics in 2021. Thanks so much for having me. Great to chat.